Neurocognitive Disorders, Dementia and Delirium by Jack Wheeler. Okay, a quick look at our objectives. We're going to look at the core features of dementia, describe the differences between dementia, delirium, and depression, identify commonly administered tests in the diagnosis of dementia, identify the seven stages of Alzheimer's and the characteristic behaviors and concerns of each stage, um, number five, identify the ways to differentiate between dementia and depression, which is also called pseudo-dementia in the elderly. And number six, understand how to utilize validation therapy techniques and how to communicate with patients with neurocognitive disorders. Number seven, work with patients to identify behaviors genetic factors and environmental factors that create a risk for delirium and dementia, which is actually something you'll you'll do if you're able to go to the, the Alzheimer's clinic. Number eight, how would you respond to a family member if who asked you if the patient will ever recognize him or her again? Number nine, identify the different subtypes of dementia. Number 10, with the caregiver, identify adaptive and maladaptive coping and coping mechanisms and develop a plan of care to assist the caregiver to manage the caregiving role. So um, that's something that you would put some thought into. It's not a, not a quick answer. <clears throat> and then number 11, um, be able to explain how, how Aricept, Exelon, Razadine, and Namenda, how do they work to slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease? All right, so this is just an overall assessment when you have an older adult of the type of things you're gonna look for. Um, any obvious fatigue, activity and tolerance, um, problems with eating, drinking, fall risk. You always wanna assess them for suicidal thoughts. A lot of times people, when they get older, they lose a lot of the people in their life and they, they know they don't have a long time to to go anyway, and so um, can become suicidal, especially if they isolate themselves and start drinking. Um, then they're, you wanna make sure their elimination is okay in their skin, especially if they're, they're incontinent of urine frequently. Um, are they sleeping okay? Are they, are they interested in things? Are they doing things? Are they just sitting, sitting in a chair watching TV all day? And then how is their memory? So that, that's what we're gonna focus on here is the memory and um, you know all of the other things with the thought process. So are they safe to live on their own? Can they use their telephone? Are they able to shop or at least use, you know, use a service like Instacart? Um, a lot of older people, they, they, they aren't really used to using a phone that way. Um, are they safe to cook? Can they prepare their own food? Do they need somebody to help with housekeeping and laundry? Um, can they drive? Are, are they safe to drive? And, you know, are they able to take their meds? Do the meds need to be set up for them in um, containers that, that go day by day? And are, their are they handling their finances okay? A lot of times, um, Criminals will target the elderly population because they know they can be vulnerable to to um, scams, and and some unscrupulous people will try to take their money. All right, dementia, the first of our two major neurocognitive disorders. About a fourth of of um, older patients admitted to the hospital show signs of at least mild dementia. Patients sometimes they're very familiar with their homes. They've lived in their homes for 20, 30 years, and they can, they can get very confused, but, but it doesn't really show at home because they're so familiar with their settings. And so when they come into the hospital, that's the first time that we see any sign of um, dementia.
All right, so defining dementia impairment in short and long-term memory, and we'll go into that in more detail in a few minutes. Inability to learn new material. Um, and there's a three-minute test that, that is very common. You'll see a, the doctor um, perform just to do a quick test of that, where you have them learn three things and then come back to that three minutes later and ask them about those three things. Um, so this can include judgment problems, thinking problems, language, and um, personality problems. And so this, this um, affects all parts of their life, basically. So this is just uh, to show you what happens to the brain with Alzheimer's. Now, not all dementia is Alzheimer's, but about 50%, 50 to 60% of dementia is Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's cannot be definitively diagnosed until autopsy, um, but, but there are predictable stages, which we'll talk about later on in this presentation. Um, you see the the cross section of the brain, the parts that are memory and language are the are the ones that are most affected. Core features of dementia, amnesia, anteriograde and retrograde. Anteriograde is the one that goes first, and that's the that's the ability to form new memories. One of the things that you'll you'll notice when you work with dementia patients is that you'll be surprised. Sometimes their long-term memory is very good, but they won't be able to tell you what they what happened earlier today or yesterday. And so that's because their ability to form new memories is the first one that goes, is the first part that goes, followed by the, the past memory. And so the past memory, sometimes we can work on things to help them, help stimulate them to remember. Um, you might notice if, if we're able to go to the Alzheimer's clinic that sometimes they have old magazines laying around and that's that's not because their subscription ran out a long time ago. It's because they want um, they're trying to stimulate that that long term memory in patients. All right. So our next core feature is aphasia and this is the disorder of language writing and writing and it most commonly it's expressive aphasia but it also can be receptive which you know, you'll talk to a patient and it, they s appear to be hearing you but then when they respond you can tell they they didn't understand anything that you said and then conductive aphasia is a little more complicated conductive aphasia means the ability to learn something and then pass it on to someone else. So not just learn it yourself, but to teach it to someone else. And so that's that, that, that one is um, very difficult for people with dementia. So we have apraxia, disorder of previously learned motor skills. So, so the example given on the slide here where they're not able to button their shirt and what's important is that there's nothing wrong with their fingers and nothing wrong with their eyesight. Um, it, it's, it's due to their, what's going on in their brain. And then we have agnosia, which is, which is um, one of the more painful things for people in the life of the person with dementia. And that's the inability to recognize something or someone, you know, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with their eyes. You know, they're not, having a vision problem they can't recognize because of what's going on in the brain so when it gets very bad they won't be able to recognize family members and I hope I won't I don't reference this too much during this PowerPoint but my mother had dementia she just died recently and when she first was it, it emerged very very quickly it was very painful that she didn't recognize me. And so um, probably one of the more painful things of my life is when my mom did not recognize me. And so it's very important that you're, you're sensitive to how painful this is to family members. Um, if you have a family member that asks you when the person's going to recognize you again, you don't, you don't, you want to use your 
T your therapeutic communication skills and you respond to their what you know their feeling is not not just the reality of what they're asking so you know the answer to that is is um you know for most people kind of comes and goes a little bit but they're never really gonna recognize you like they used to it'll you know ebb and flow and um you know the the first part of your answer to a, a family member asking about that should be you know i know that's really I, that's really hard when your family member doesn't recognize you anymore executive dysfunction this is where in social situations um probably the the classic one is is at a family gathering the person with with dementia will blurt out some family secret that that is um you know they've been keeping for a long time you know he's not really your father those, those kind of family secrets or or it could be something that that um is just totally inappropriate but they don't have um you know they can't really have them in social situations when they when when the executive dysfunction gets really bad i remember i had a man with dementia and his um his father who was very elderly died and his father had been the one that raised his sons he had two two young adult sons in their early 20s and this person had you know he couldn't in in the groups he would say inappropriate things so the sons came and they wanted to take him out on a pass and bring him to the funeral and i, ne I needed to sit down with the sons and say you know the sons had a lot of anger at him anyway for having dementia he had dementia because he was an alcoholic you know which we'll talk about later how that causes dementia and so they already kind of had some anger at this at their father and so i just knew if they took him to the funeral he was going to blurt out something inappropriate during the funeral and they would be even more angry at him and so i was able to talk the sons into um you know abandoning the idea of bringing him to the funeral you know with the, the reality that he was not going to be able to contain you know his his ability to um avoid inappropriate outbursts and so that was you know that was hard so another thing about dementia they have full alertness they don't have an altered level of consciousness like we'll, we'll talk about with delirium the second half of this lecture there is an alter an alteration in their level of consciousness so that's one way you can tell those two apart so subtypes of dementia like i said alzheimer's is not all dementia which some people kind of mix up the terms but it is about 50 to 60 percent of dementia and so there's alzheimer's there's what's called the lewy body variant which is some people consider it a, a more aggressive variant of alzheimer's there's other people that consider it a different form of dementia altogether um the Lewy body variant it has a more rapid rate of decline um, and the person can be very psychotic and very violent this is the the diagnosis that that the comedian actor robin williams was diagnosed with and you know if you know the the case he he killed himself after this diagnosis and it's very unusual if you get a diagnosis of dementia for the person to kill themselves because it it comes on so slow and it doesn't usually come with a lot of impulsiveness and um you know it, it's it, it takes a lot of organization also to kill yourself and so it's unusual for that to happen but with the louis, louis body variant it's a little bit different because the person is so violent and it's so intense and you can also imagine a person like robin williams the you know he was a comedian and he was very outlandish with his emotions and behavior and he was very proud of his intellect and so that was um you know knowing that 
that um, all of that was going to go away was very intolerable for him. And so you can see where the, that would lead to a suicide for him. Right, vascular dementia. This is, you know, just just like with with other problems where your blood vessels are at risk, your your brain has blood vessels also that require, you know, the blood to bring nutrition to the brain, and so all of those risk factors are the same: diabetes, hypertension, smoking, coronary artery disease, um, increased lipids, and so this kind of this in fact this is the kind of dementia that my mother had and she had it from multiple multiple um trans tias transkey i can't remember what tia stands for anyway um this is also common with stroke victims and and um the presentation it, it's not as predictable it, with Alzheimer's, the descent is usually kind of slow and progressive, and there's there's stages that we're going to talk about. But with the vascular dementia, it's it's unpredictable, um, but but it's from the actual damage to the brain from all of these little um, events. So sometimes the and just the example here, sometimes you'll think your diabetic patient is just being non-compliant when actually they're they're impaired cognitively because they're they're starting to show the signs of vascular dementia. Hey, HIV dementia, and this is this is one of the ones where um, if you can get them back on their HIV medications, sometimes they can make a dramatic improvement because you know, there'll be an, a direct infection to the brain. And so um, it, it is one that, that there, there is some hope of being reversed if it's being, you know, if the person's been off their meds. Our next one, substance abuse. There's something called Korsakoff syndrome, also known as Korsakoff psychosis. And this is somebody that's abused alcohol for a long period of time. And um, it's caused by a thiamine deficiency, which is the vitamin B1. And alcohol depletes your body of that. That's why part of our alcohol detox protocol, it, you usually give a patient a supplement of um, thiamine. We have frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder, not very common. Um, this is another one where the person has angry outbursts and they can be violent and throw things. They're not as confused and sometimes gets mixed. You know, it looks very much like the Lewy body variant that we talked about a few slides ago. Um, again, that this is another one where the person can be violent and they're a little less confused. So it looks it looks different. These are people, just like with the Louis body, it's, it's very stressful for caregivers. Um, it's very hard to take care of a loved one that's, that's being violent toward you. And um, yeah, very difficult, very stressful. So I have dementia that's secondary to Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis. Um, these are neuro degenerative disorders and so you know it, it kind of you know it's a breakdown on your brain which is what neurodegenerative means and so um, obviously de dementia is uh, something that comes along with that and um, not to get more into my life but my dad has Parkinson's and we we're starting to see some dementia with him luckily it's not too bad we have normal pre pressure hydrocephalus, which is um, relieved with a shunt placement in the brain. And this is, the terminology can be confusing because it, it is, you know, you can relieve the pressure in the brain with a shunt and it helps. When we say normal pressure, it's compared to, to the intense pressure of, a, of another kind of medical emergency. So that's why it's termed that way. Um, they, they do 
tons of these in the surgery department at Alta Bates. You know, several of these a day, and it's very effective. You know, it can it can cause symptom relief pretty quick. Sometimes it's hard because um, the family members will expect too much because some you, you'll hear stories of it causing a dramatic improvement. But for most people, it, it causes kind of a minor improvement. Then we have dementia caused from head trauma. The, the most famous example recently is from retired NFL football players. This also happens from head trauma from any any cause, of course. Um, car accidents, you know, somebody that's been a victim of violence, you know, other sports. I'm sure in the future with, when all of these UFC fighters get older, you know, they, they take some intense hits to the brain, to the head. And um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see them having a lot of these kind of problems. One of the interesting things about the head trauma with NFL players it seems to be worse to get, instead of getting the big hits all at once, to get multiple small hits, which is, is um, so, some of the worst cases are the people that get hit frequently, not as dramatically, but frequently like the just the linemen that block each other. All right, and then we have um, our comorbidity morbidities, the things that kind of go along with it that are, that are psychiatric issues. So psychosis is common. People have um, frequently have paranoid delusions and some of the common ones will be somebody sneaking into my house and stealing things. Um, some other of the more, you know, sound a little scarier, the person will say they're, they're being raped every day by people at their residence. And then when you investigate it, you know, it's not, you know, it's not realistic. Um, and so it's, it's a, a sad thing that can, can set in that, that um, makes the person uncomfortable. So delirium, another complication. So even, even though we we're talking about our, our neurocognitive disorders, the two main ones, dementia and delirium, they're not mutual exclusive. So somebody can have dementia and then have delirium kind of superimposed on it. Um, very common to see somebody with dementia have uh, delirium just late in the evening, which we call sundowning. So they're, you know, they're okay. They're confused, but they're okay behavior wise most of the day. And then it, in the evening time, um, you know, can be much more confused and a fall risk and, and, and have all of those kind of issues we're going to talk about in the second half of this, this lecture. And then anxiety, very, you know, especially if they're having paranoia, like we talked about previously. Um, for a long time, we would, you know, we alternate between strategies that there's nothing that that is perfect for a medication strategies. Benzodiazepines, they actually decrease your cognitive functioning. So those, those aren't good. They can also increase fall risk in people that are already a high fall risk. So the drug of choice for a long time was low dose antipsychotics, generally, generally um, second generation antipsychotics like Risperdal. Um, but the problem with that is it was found that in frail elderly adults, especially frail, you know, very thin, um, there's a risk of sudden death, which is a, a very, you know, that's a very bad side effect. So the, so the American Medical Association now recommends not using low dose antipsychotics. Um, a lot of the, the doctors still use them though if they if they feel like the person is not frail. And so a little bit controversial. Um, but yeah, the doctors, they kind of go back and forth and different doctors have different views of this. They might be more willing to use a low dose antipsychotic if they know the person, if they don't think they're frail, but they are a fall risk, they might go that direction. There's no cut and dry um, 
strategy though they all have to try to individualize it and help the patient um, with the lowest risk possible okay another side effect of um, well, comorbidity that can go along with dementia is depression one of the challenges is that depression in the, the elderly can come along with a lot of significant confusion and cognitive decline and actually look like dementia. So we, we'll call, in that case, we call it pseudo-dementia. One of the ways to tell the difference is that, um, you know, which is what differential diagnosis means is with the depressed person, they're more likely to answer, I don't know. Whereas the demented patient will do what's called confabulation. Confabulation means the person is, you know, when they can't remember something, they're, they're as a defense mechanism, they, they try to guess what should have happened. And so they'll tell you that like they're remembering it, but it's actually, it's, it's not a memory. It's, um, they're, they're not intentionally lying. They're just kind of filling in the gap. Um, but the, the demented, I mean, the, the person that's actually just depressed, they're going to, they're going to be upset when they realize they can't remember the person that has actual dementia. They're not going to be upset when they don't remember, when they don't know an answer. Um, they'll just either tell you the wrong thing or confabulate, you know, like I mentioned. Right now we've come to Alzheimer's. There's seven stages of Alzheimer's, and you know this was redone a couple years ago. There used to just be three stages, but of course they had to make it more complicated for us. Seven stages of Alzheimer's. So stage one, no apparent symptoms. Um, I'm not quite sure why they would add a stage with no apparent symptoms. Stage two, just your normal forgetness forgetfulness that's not noticed by other people stage three this is where we're um it's starting to be noticed by other people in their life especially if they have a job where they have to be responsible for a lot of things that they're gonna you know it's gonna get noticed by coworkers. um they're gonna get lost driving even to places that are familiar they might get lost driving on the way home um and that's that's sad all right stage four they start to forget major events in their life and this is a stage where they they you know they're still aware enough where they're they're getting depressed and they're also getting very self-conscious that people are noticing that their memory is so bad so this is why they start to withdraw socially they don't want to go to family gatherings um, they don't want, you know, they don't want it to come out. They're, they're in some denial usually and trying to hide it. Stage five um, progresses further where they're, they're not taking care of their ADLs. It might be somebody that's always been clean and, and you know, neat and well presented. And suddenly they're very disheveled. They don't smell. You can tell they're, they're not showering enough. They're not... Um, you know, they might not be wiping themselves after going to the bathroom very well. And so, you know, that that's where, you know, it gets more and more. And then the next stages are, are where um, they almost always need care around the clock. So stage six, this is where wandering off can be a problem. You have to have a caregiver. You can... Um, most of the time they need to be in an institution. You, you can have a, if there's a caregiver that's, especially somebody that's aware, there can be alarms on all the doors and um, bed alarms. And, um, you know, it, it's very dangerous to wander off. Most people that, that are, have dementia and wander off, if they're not found within the first 24 hours, they're usually found dead. It's very dangerous to, to wander off when you're confused like that. 
So stage seven is, is severe cognitive decline. They don't, not only they don't recognize their family, but they don't even recognize themselves in the mirror. They're not able to walk. They're usually just kind of sitting there in a stupor, um, kind of staring, staring at the ground sometimes. Usually the way they die is they, you know, one of the ways that they die is they, they forget how to swallow and they kind of aspirate their food. Other ways are they choke, you know, they can choke to death. They'll get a, you know, from as swallowing their food down the wrong way, they'll get food in their lungs and get, that'll turn into pneumonia. And so, um, it, it's a, not, not a very comfortable way to die. All right. So our tests for, for memory, there's two big ones. The classic one we're going to talk about first. This is the mini mental state examination. And it's a, about a 10 minute test of orientation. We'll, I'll probably have you do this with each other when we do our next, um, psych skills lab. Um, the MMSE, it's quick. It tests all, of, you know, the different parts of, of, um, cognitive skills and generally people like a perfect score on this would be a 30 a score less than 10 means they're severely impaired um and you know people with mild alzheimer's at the start they usually score between 19 and 24 and like you see on the slide here people with alzheimer's they tend to lose three to four points each year so it doesn't take very long to get to where you're severely impaired. This test, it's not just used for dementia. It's also used, you'll notice if you're in a rotation at a, at a hospital where we have electroconvulsive therapy, this is a, a test that we give to, to, um, patients that are getting a course of, of, um, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT. And we'll give it to them every time before an ECT treatment, just to make sure, first of all, we know what their baseline is for this test. And then also to make sure the, the ECT is not affecting their, their scores, you know, not, not, not affecting their memory. Okay. So we have a, an alternative to this, and I know on, um, some units, this is the preferred one. It's a, it's a more recent test. It's less language based than the mini mental status exam. And so it's thought to be more sensitive to, um, especially with people with a little less education that might, might read a lot or, or may, may have never been real literate in their life, um, has, uh, areas where you, you identify animals, where you you draw on a clock what time it is, connect the dots. So it's more, um, has more kind of things that you do manually versus just language based. Um, and this one we'll probably also do in the skills lab. These are good to know because sometimes, you know, those will be ordered to be done on a patient. If you, or in your site clinical, you can ask your, your instructor to, to do it with you. If, um, you know, that's going to be ordered on one of your nurses patients. And, you know, it's a, it's one of the things we're allowed to do that'll help the nurse, um, you know, with their workload and also be an educational experience experience for you. So these are interesting. And then we have our one mild cognitive impairment that's this sometimes is the kind of a pre dementia um diagnosis and the reason why we have this is because it, it um allows insurance to pay for for treatment for um the medications that help help slow the progression of it if it is going to be dementia or Alzheimer's, the cholinase inhibitors, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes when we get to the meds. Um, let's see. 
it, it can help have the decline not go too fast. One of the problems with medications for dementia, it's really hard to tell how fast the person would have progressed without them. And so the effectiveness, effectiveness of these medications, it, you know, we're really just kind of taking a guess at how much they help. They can, um, you know, have some side effects. So, you know, they shouldn't just be given to every, everyone. All right, so nursing care, of course, our short-term goal is to help them function as well as possible. The long-term goal is that they'll, you know, that they'll have a, a peaceful, safe, safe death that they're, they're not going to die from wandering off and they're not going to be terrified, you know, falling down a bluff or something, getting hit by a car or some, something like that um, is the way that they die. And then one of our big tools with nursing care is they really respond well to a daily activity schedule. Um, some of the things that are helpful you know, just I'll just give you an example. When my mom got dementia, I found out my dad was showering her without a shower chair. I found out that, um, you know, when I went to go buy a shower chair for them, that they actually have shower chairs for people with dementia, so the person will remember what's supposed to happen. And you know, it's a like a light, bright light blue, and you know, it's it's. I don't, you know, I don't know if that helped or not that it was memorable, but it, it kind of makes sense. Um, and then just have a, a schedule that's like the same thing every day. That's, that's very helpful. The person needs a structure, not too many choices. They don't need reality. I mean, they don't need um, variety in their day. They need a, they need structure. They need the same thing happening every day. Um, what some people have done is, is if you know the per person's favorite songs, especially from when they were young, you know, and there there are songs that are the soothing songs, you can play those while you're you're doing the bathing. You know, the the first things in the morning is, you know, just make sure the caregiver can stand the songs. <laughs> okay, so some basic nursing care you want to prevent injury, not have them wonder and this is when we say nursing care we mean in the hospital so once they're you've admitted somebody to the hospital that's on your unit so you know hopefully you have a, a bed that has a bed alarm so if they get up in the middle of the night you know it goes off um you know if they are somebody that's going to wonder and you always want to treat them like they're going to wonder even if maybe there's no collateral information from the family saying that they do because people are more confused in the hospital, like we said earlier on. Um, and so they might wonder in the hospital, even if they don't wonder at home. You want a room near the nursing station if you're not able to have them on a one-to-one, -one, you know, have a one-to-one -one staff, usually a CNA with them. See, we talked about the bed alarm. We want to, we don't want them in a high bed. We want them in a low bed. So if they fall out, they're, they're less likely to be injured. If you have to have them on IVs or, or um, you know, a um, Foley or anything like that, you want to make sure that's covered so that they don't pull on them. Like I said, sitters, we frequently use sitters. Other times, sometimes the family members will want to stay. And, you know, it's a little different with COVID sometimes if we're where we are in the pandemic with that, but we can let family members also stay over if they want to try to help. Um, reduce environmental stimuli, which can be hard, especially if you give them a room near the nursing station where there's the most noise usually. You don't want them to have a room near the door where there's going to be a lot of noise, but um, you also want them to be somewhere where you can, you know, you can observe them easily. And then if they have hearing aids or glasses, it's really helpful if they can if they can see and hear. You know, it helps keep them less confused. And it's also, you know, just kind of the basically decent thing to do. Remember with hearing aids, if you're in a major hospital, 
you know, sometimes people come in and they, they haven't really used them a lot at home. They just have the TV blasting. Um, but it, it can be because they don't have the current battery. Most of the time, if you're in a major hospital, there's, there's an audiology clinic somewhere in the hospital where they have batteries that fit most of the hearing aids. And then when you give them directions, we give them step-by-step -step directions. And so what that means is, is normal, normal things that you would say to somebody, if you were going to tell somebody to get up out of a chair, you would just tell them to stand up. Um, but somebody with dementia, you're going to give, give, tell, explain every step of that, which you may have not have even thought of before. But you're going to tell them to put your feet on the floor, you know, put your you know hand out to secure yourself on your on the hand rests or you know, whatever's around, and push up, you know, and describe step by step standing up basically. So validation therapy, with, with, what that means with somebody with dementia, when, when somebody has like a five or 10 minute memory, we, we don't orient them to reality the way we would with a normal patient. So, you know, if your patient is saying, I have to, you know, you know that the patient's spouse died 10 years ago, and the patient is telling you that, um, now I've got to get up. My husband is waiting to pick me up. You're not going to tell them, no, ma'am, your husband died 10 years ago. You're in the hospital. Because, you know, she's going to be upset by that. And also, you know, you've just upset the patient and she's not going to remember five minutes later anyway. And so what you want to try to do is validate their, the feelings that are underneath whatever they're asking for. An example is, um, I think we have a, a question later on in, at the end of this presentation. You know, it's a woman that, that says, I have to go home because I need to make dinner for my kids. So the, the reality orientation would be, no, ma'am, you're in the hospital. You don't have kids at home. But what you're going to say is, oh, it sounds like you're, do you miss your kids or do you miss cooking? Um, those kind of things to, you want to try to reflect the underlying feeling of the, the, what the patient is saying, not, not the, not the content. Don't let the content distract you. Um, and keep the sentences simple, concrete, you know, not, not wordy, not long, and definitely no medical terminology. One of the, the tricks, especially in a late stage patient, which, um, you know, the, they're not going to be talking a lot any, anyway, but um, if you want to try to get their attention and get below their eye level. All right, so part of your assessment, are they disoriented? And this is to pick up on dementia. Do, are they a poor historian? Do they look to the family? You ask them a, quite a direct question to them and they look to the caregiver for answers. Um, they fail to, you know, they can't follow instruction. They're not trying to be difficult, but they can't, can't do what you're asking them to do. They have trouble word finding when they're, you know, they can't find a common word. Although I have to say that's a common, common experience that people have especially when they get over 50 years old that it, it you know you're talking and there's a word and you just can't find it so don't be concerned if that's happened to you that's just a common you know how how brains are when you're getting older that doesn't mean you have dementia but for them it's much it's much worse and then they can't really follow the conversation there's a lot of difficulty around that all right so with the meds we have our, our first three main ones here, um, Aricept, Exelon, and, and Razodyne. And what they do is they increase the acetylcholine by inhibiting the enzyme that metabolizes it between the, um, you know, between the neurons. And so you can start that early. Like I said, with the mild cognitive impairment, you can start these medications. 
to increase the acetylcholine and um, and you know that can help. There there used to be one we used named Cognex, Cognex, but um, it's a little tough on the liver, so we don't use it anymore in the U.S. I think it is still used sometimes in other countries, so that's why I still have it on here. Then we have another medication that um, works in a little different way. It, it, it actually increases glutamate. If you remember from our psychopharmacology lecture, um, the two neurotransmitters that primarily help with memory are acetylcholine and glutamate. And so Namenda is the one that um, really helps to increase glutamate. So you'll usually see one of um, one of the three medications from the previous group used along with Namenda in a patient that has a healthy liver, healthy kidneys, and um, you know they're just trying to do everything they can to preserve whatever memory for the person for the rest of their life. The definition here it, it's quite complicated the way the way um, Namenda works. So, um, so I, I don't usually test you on the way Namenda works, but I, I will test you on the way the previous three work. With Namenda, what you should probably remember and then what you would probably need to know for the NCLEX, just remember Namenda helps by increasing glutamate. The other three help by increasing acetylcholine and they're frequently used in you know, one from the previous group and, and Namenda. That's that's the most common thing you'll see these days in in um, people with severe dementia. So needs of the caregiver, we try to not um, remove people from their home until we absolutely have to. So some of the things they they need to be educated so that they're not getting upset with a patient or we can help them be patient, be, you know, have patience with the, the person with dementia. Anything kind of legal needs, like, uh, you know, if if they need to do a will, all that needs to be taken care of but the, before the dementia progresses too far where they where the, none of that can be taken care of. Um, do not resuscitate all of those type of issues need to be in place. Um, support groups for the caregiver are important. It's especially good these days with, with Zoom so that they can actually still be in the house, house, you know, watching the patient and attend those type of caregiver, you know, support groups. A lot of depression for caregivers and a lot of burnout, especially if it's all put on one person. You know, in some families, it can fall on, I think, the youngest daughter, you know, it'll fall on. So it, it's really important to to um, encourage families to, to share this burden whenever possible and, and when not possible to hire caregivers at least a couple times a week to, to relieve that person. So with the caregiver, you want to establish a relationship with that person have empathy for them. You know, they might have their own grief going on. They're, they're losing the person at the same time. You know, they're with them all the time and they're very stressed out. You know, it can be hard because they're, they might be taking care of the person that they love and that person doesn't remember them and, you know, and doesn't appreciate it. And, you know, might even be verbally abusive to them or even physically abusive. And so it's important to help them with their coping skills. It's another way to help help um, you know prevent el elder abuse with somebody that's that's a difficult one to take care of, which is a, a future lecture. Um, and then, of course, you have to train whoever's the caregiver how to administer the patient's meds. You can't, you know, obviously the person has a severe memory issue. You're not going to be training them about their meds. You're going to do it with whoever's taking care of them. So we have dementia daycare programs, which is an example is the, the one we sometimes are able to send students to in Berkeley, the Alzheimer's of the East Bay. Um, 
it's also considered a social daycare where they're they're you know they go there just for the day and um the program has a little van where it can go around and pick them up that's very helpful for the especially for the caregivers to give them a break give them a chance to go and you know take courses if they're they're trying to establish something in their life or or just have a social life away from the person they're taking care of Our other major neurocognitive disorder that we're going to discuss is delirium, also seen in about a fourth of all hospitalized, hospitalized older patients. Delirium develops in a very short period of time, sometimes just a few hours or days. And it's most common in the elderly. It's not only in the elderly, but it's most common then. It's reversible in most most um, instances and basically what you have to find is what is the underlying cause it's um you know there, there's not like any generic treatment for delirium you have to find out the underlying cause and treat that and that's what takes care of the delirium 25 percent of elderly with delirium you know will will die so it's very serious so different cognitive cognitive factors happen it, it's a it's for whatever reason there there's a, a change in the you know in the substance needed for the brain and so um it interferes with the acetylcholine and then um throws everything off that way increased cortisol level that that happens when you're stressed that also affects it risk factors older age Having dementia, infections can cause delirium, um, any kind of severe illness, especially if it goes along with dehydration. Post-operative status, sometimes people will come out of their surgery coming out of the anesthesia and the anesthesia has actually caused the delirium. And so people come out and they'll, they'll be completely, you know, off the wall and delirious and a very high fall risk and um, need to be restrained until, until that can be corrected. Alcoholism can cause it, um, it's, you know, especially withdrawal. That's, that's one of our big things. Um, they're going into delirium tremors. That's something you'll, a phrase that you'll hear. Um, having something happen to your vision Fractures, a, a fracture will, will release chemicals into your bloodstream that cause it. Diabetes, when um, the blood sugar is too high, heart disease, and then um, just a very big stress can do it as well. Very unfamiliar environment, which is why it happens in the hospital, for especially for older people. Right, so some medications that can actually cause delirium. Cogentin, this is why, you know, we give cogentin frequently to counter, kind of prevent the, the what's called the extra pyramidal symptoms in a patient that has, you know, that we're giving antipsychotic medications to, especially first generation antipsychotics. And we have to be very careful not to give them too much or it'll actually cause delirium and cause the patient's behavior to be even worse. Um, other anticholergics that could cause this, Benadryl, atropine, anti-Parkinson agents can cause this. And this actually happened with my father. He was on um, one of these, I believe it was amantatine, when, when um, even though the, the doctor told him not to take any medication without checking with him first, my dad got a cold and he took some cold medication. And it actually made him delirious and um, my mom overheard him talking to um, having a full-on conversation with somebody that wasn't there he thought he was talking to his older brother who had had died years before benzodiazepines i've seen it happen it's very, it's pretty it's more rare with benzodiazepines but i've seen it happen with um ativan with the 
unfortunate young 12 year old lady and then our codeine and morphine it can happen pretty quickly with the, those ones as well so assessing this um seeing it as delirium as for what it actually is it happens quickly so so the patient was normal they were generally somebody that was with it that was high functioning and suddenly suddenly they're all over the place they're walking into other patients rooms they're um, getting agitated and they might take a swing at you when you're trying to care for them um, they're very different they're not able to focus they're disorganized incoherent and um, you, you know you can tell cognitively that they're, they're off they do have an altered level of consciousness, which is is different from the patient with dementia that has full alertness, if you remember from earlier in this lecture. And they can be hypervigilant, which is, is, is a form of paranoia where they're kind of looking, scanning the environment for danger. Um, they're also going to be very lethargic and disoriented. So our goals for them, first of all, we have to find out what's causing it have to take care of the underlying cause to, to get them out of this. Um, and in the meantime, while we're trying to figure that out, we have to protect them. We can't allow them to, to get hurt. We can't allow them to fall. They're a very high fall risk. Um, usually the, the biggest danger for them is, um, you know, one of the nursing diagnoses you would use is, is um, risk for falls and then whatever you can do to help relieve their distress and, and have them in a room that's that's has dim lights if you can have them with a one-to-one -to, -one to keep them safe um, there, there's a lot of ways they can get hurt with this usually by a fall and you know they're they don't have good, they don't have their judgment it's not intact so sometimes they're impulsive they'll get up on something and then it's very dangerous to fall off. We had a patient that got up, I, I sent her to the ER when she had delirium and she'd actually jumped up on a gurney at the ER staff, you know, in the, in the ER um, department. And um, we had to have a, a code to try to get her down safely without her falling. And so our long-term goals is that we'll return her to her previous level of functioning sometimes patients will will you know whatever's gone wrong will will correct itself and then we want to try to figure out you know what was the cause so that that doesn't happen again again like i said these are these episodes are very dangerous for the patient so um you know perceptual disturbances what you'll see is somebody with delirium, they're, they'll have visual hallucinations that are up close. Um, they'll see, you know, bugs crawling on them. You'll see them picking at the air, trying to, trying to pick bugs. Um, that patient that I gave the example that I sent to the ER, she, she had, she was reaching down at her feet when she was sitting in a chair and I asked her, what are you doing? And she says, I dropped my cigarettes. I'm trying to pick up my cigarettes. And so the one way to tell the difference between visual hallucinations with somebody that's um, delirious, you know, that are caused by delirium versus a patient that has a psychotic disorder that that's, um, has visual hallucinations. With delirium, the hallucinations are close up. They're um, visual, they can also be tactile. They'll feel bugs crawling on them. Um, but they're close, the visual hallucinations are close. The, with somebody that has psychosis that's schizophrenic or they might um, have psychosis at the extremes of, of um, bipolar disorder, the mania and depression, their psychosis still, their visual hallucinations will be far away. And using some kind of menacing person like out of the corner of their eye or in the back of the room, far away for, for um, psychosis with with a, a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia whereas 
not to repeat myself too much, but delirium, it's close up. The visual hallucinations are close. All right, and then, um, so psychomotor agitation, they're gonna be agitated, they're gonna be impulsive, they're gonna not have good balance, they're gonna have a very unsteady gait. And you know they're they're not going to have any kind of sleep wake cycle. You'll you'll be very lucky if they go to sleep. They they do need to be on a one to one if they have delirium, and you know it, it's so serious if they're if they're not on a one to one and they get injured, it can end up on a with a complaint against your nursing license. That's how that's how it's a standard out there that it's common. Somebody with delirium needs to be on a one to one in the hospital. All right, so these are just some examples of nursing diagnosis for the these and the, these um, you know they might need IV fluids. They're probably not going to eat if they're in an acute delirious um, episode, but if you can, you know you want to try to do what you can, and you know you're going to try to. And if you don't know what's causing it, you're going to try to get the, give them an IV, but you're going to have to secure the site, and they're you know they're a danger to just pull it right out. Um, so you'll you'll need to secure it, and you might have to restrain this patient if you're you're going to realistically try to give them IVs. And and um, one of the common things with a patient that has delirium from from um, alcohol withdrawal is you need to give them IV Ativan, usually IV Ativan, and so you'll need to, probably need to restrain them and able to do that safely. All right, so risk for injury, and the risk for injury is due to falls. So other things you need to make sure there's an ID band on the patient. If they do get out, you wanna make sure that, um, you know, people, whoever finds them will know where they belong and who they are. So skin integrity, with, with that, we're actually talking about somebody that has, um, somebody with delirium that has uh, kind of regularly with somebody that, that, an example, somebody that has the sun downing issues where it's kind of predictable. So you're gonna make sure that they're, they're not having breakdown. All right, so sleep pattern disturbance, we talked about that, a well-lit environment. That doesn't mean lights blaring on them, but they, you know, they, they don't need to um, be stumbling over things because they can't see. And then medication to reduce the agitation where you're trying to figure it out. Sometimes it's hard because the doctor doesn't want to give them Ativan they, because, you know, like I said, in rare cases, that can be the cause of delirium. Um, so, so it's a challenge to, as to the medication strategy. We want to make sure that, it, that, um, we're not making the delirium worse with our medications. So when we say provide unconditional positive regard, that's, that's actually a, a term by the, that was made famous by the psychologist Carl Rogers in the 1950s and 1960s with the humanist form school of psychology um what that means is is you're try to have a positive attitude about them regardless of what they do understand that they're not responsible for what what's going on right now and you know you want to acknowledge their feelings um one of the common mistakes people make is somebody that's delirium has delirium and is confused ask them why are you doing that you know and, these kind of quizzing questions that the person can't answer and it just makes them more disoriented and agitated to be asked over and over again, what are you doing? They don't know what they're doing, That they, they're delirious. Um, when I hear staff say that kind of thing, I wanna say, well, what are you doing? You're not delirious, why are you, why are you saying the wrong thing? Anyway, <laughs> um, try to be calm and reassuring and you know, you, you, your ability to be calm can help the patient stay calm. 
And, you know, if they are having what's called illusions where they're seeing things, things that are actually there, but misperceiving them like, a, you know, they see a chair, but they think it's some kind of threatening figure or something like that. Just remove the chair, remove whatever you can that, um, that the patient is misinterpreting as something dangerous. And then if you do want to know a pain status on them, um, you can use their facial expression, restlessness. You can also use a face pain chart to, you know, to get an idea. Again, you're not going to give them opiates. Remember the, the codeine and morphine and that class of medications can actually be a cause of delirium. So respond to the, to what they're feeling. Don't argue with them about the content if they're hallucinating. That kind of goes along the same way if you have if they're hallucinating, you know, when they're psychotic with schizophrenia, with a, a psychotic disorder. I will always respond to hallucinations to the feeling tone and the theme and you know what do they think it's going to make them feel safe, not to the content. Okay, and I talked about not quizzing them with the orientation questions. And if they have eyeglasses or hearing aids, we want to try to get them those as well. Although you want to be careful. If somebody's really delirious, um, they're going to end up losing their eyeglasses and things like that. So so just use your judgment with that. And like I said, they'll, they'll need a one-to-one -one staff if they're, you know, if they're truly in full-blown delirium. All right, so some quizzes, quiz questions. A patient whose medical diagnosis is dementia and nursing diagnosis is self-care deficit lives in a skilled nursing facility. In providing the care, the most important consideration is A, administration of Aricept is ordered, B, the daily activity schedule, C, the use of POSI restraints for safety, D, allow the patient choices. So normally if I was doing this lecture, I would give you a chance and then I would um, go over these. Since this is a, re a pre-recorded lecture, what you can do is stop the recording right now if you want to think about this. Uh, you know, so, but if you don't stop the recording right now, I'm about to tell you, go over the answers. So um, A, the administration of Aricept is ordered. So, you know, like I said, it, these medications, it's hard to judge what they really do because you don't know how the patient would look if they didn't have these. They don't, they don't, they don't really fix the issue. They just kind of slow the, the decline is, is what we're hoping they're doing. Um, so, you know, they keep the acetylcholine, you know, they boost it up by, by eliminating that enzyme that, that reduces it between the neurotransmitters, between the nerve cells. Um, but that, that's not the most important consideration. The, actually, B here, the daily activity schedule, that's the most important consideration, especially with the self-care deficit patient that, that um, you know, you're trying to help them with their ADLs and get all that kind of organized. The posy rate for posy restraint for safety, they probably don't need that. They don't need to be restrained unless they're they're doing some serious wandering or, you know, with the patient that sometimes violent, like the one with um, the frontotemporal neurocognitive or, or um, the Lewy body. Sometimes still they might need to be restrained for their violence, but um, generally they don't. And giving patients choices, they they don't do well with choices. So you want to limit their choices. Sometimes, you know, if you're feeding a patient, you'll give them one to two foods to choose from. That can be okay, but more than that is is um, it just makes them more disorienting, disoriented. All right, the nurse is carrying a for a patient with dementia. Whenever the nurse attempts to bathe the patient, the patient screams and spits. The cause of this behavior is A, this is a common symptom of dementia. B, the patient needs sedating medications. C, fear arising from confusion. 
and D, the patient has sundowning syndrome. You know, which D doesn't really make sense because you usually bathe the patient in the morning. Anyway, the so um, the patient screaming and, and spitting. I think the obvious answer here is fear arising from confusion. So, you know, if you have a very confused patient, they they're not oriented to event. They they don't know what's going on, and you start trying to bathe them without them understanding. First of all, you're you're putting yourself at risk for them hitting you because you know if you're confused, you don't know what's going on, and then somebody comes and they're they're starting to try to take your clothes off and put water on you. You know that that can be very threatening. Um, so I, this is probably the easier one of these questions. Fear arising from confusion. All right, the nurse is caring for a patient with moderate dementia who's lost weight recently. The most important in intervention is to A, place one to two foods at a time, B, provide a balanced diet, C, feed the patient, D, give a puree diet in thick fluids. Um, so like I just mentioned, the placing the one to two foods at a time, that's, that's not a bad strategy. That's not a completely wrong answer. Um, the best option here is if somebody has time is to attempt to feed the patient. The The big thing here is they've lost weight. And if they, they get malnourished, you know, mal, malnourished, they're not going to be able to think properly. That affects your mentation. And so um, we really want to make sure we correct that. So feeding the patient is the correct answer here. D, giving a puree diet and thick fluids that would be somebody that has a real swallowing issue and um you know you would you wouldn't do that unless um somebody trained in that had had made that evaluation a pureed diet and thick fluids is is not going to encourage the patient to eat it, do, it generally doesn't taste very good if you ever are on a unit and a patient is discharged and a tray comes up that's for that patient that's a pureed diet Go ahead and take a few bites. See what you would think. <laughs> it's um, it's very it's you know it's it's not very appetizing at all. all. Right, your patient is in a skilled nursing facility with dementia. She tells you she needs to go home and fix dinner for her children. The nurse's best aunt response is a tell her she's in a skilled nursing facility. Meals are served. B state that her children do not live here. C, ask her what she would like to prepare. D, reflect that she misses her children. So like I said, again, if you want to think about this for a second, stop the recording now. Um, so A would be reality reorientation. Tell her she's in a sniff, meals are served. That's not what we do with a dementia patient. Remember, we're using what we call val validation therapy. Um, B is another reality orientation that you wouldn't do. State that our children do not live here. So C and D, they both they both could be right. So um, in the spirit of nursing questions, which of which do you think is the most right? Um, and you know, in, in a situation like this, you want to ask. What you would do is, is make your best guess. So if I was looking at this, I would think that, that maybe she needs to miss, you know, maybe she misses her children. And so D is the one that I would, I would say is the correct answer. Um, you know, in the real world, if, if that didn't, you know, if she didn't respond to that, it might be that she wants to, that the fixing dinner part is the more meaningful part of it to her. And so I might ask her what she'd like to prepare because it might be that she misses cooking and it's not really that she misses her children um, so much. Um, yeah, and it could be just that she misses having a role, you know, that her role as mother is something that she misses. And so it could be that as well as a, an additional answer that that's not a choice here. But um, yeah, and this is why people you know, you can be the greatest nursing student in the world. You're still, 
never going to get 100 percent on nursing exams because you know so much of it is is um subjective like these type of questions all right so methods to prevent wondering in a demented hospitalized patient include a a bed near the nursing station b an alarm system c a sitter d toilet the patient at regular intervals you know or e all of the above so this one is pretty easy that um, probably you would recognize this as E, all of the above. And just to explain, if you're some of this that I may not have covered, toileting the patient at regular intervals, it just keeps them from having to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. You know, if you have a patient, especially if the patient's not on a one-to-one -one yet, you know, or, or has been judged not to really need a one-to-one, -one, um, you know, when you're in an unfamiliar environment, even if you don't have dementia, getting up in the middle of the night, it's confusing. If you've ever been on vacation or, you know, just sleeping away from your regular household, you get up in the middle of the night and you don't really remember you are trying to find to, the place to go to the bathroom is disorienting. And so that can kind of start a patient that, that you know, might wonder that normally would not. All right, just a quick look back at the objectives. Number one, the core features of dementia. We talked about amnesia, anterior grade and retrograde, aphasia, the different forms, expressive, receptive, and conductive, apraxia, which is a disorder of previously learned motor skills, agnosia, where you don't recognize something or someone despite you know your centuries are intact, executive dysfunction, and then full alertness all right and then um number two describe the differences between dementia delirium and depression dementia develops very slowly while delirium comes on very fast and is acute dementia is um is generally a, a, a decompensation that takes a while delirium happens very fast and delirium has an altered level of consciousness and a very unsteady gait delirium we don't know the causes um i mean, I mean the big thing is th there's a what's called an organic or structural or you know chemical problem that that has happened that's causing this and um making the person very impulsive and um dangerous dementia has multiple causes also but it but it develops slowly and it's more of a chronic problem and depression in the elderly it can look like dementia because there's a lot of confusion involved in depression in the elderly but um, the ways that you can tell that apart which I know we're gonna actually, actually I'll save that for number five there's a little bit of overlap there Commonly administered tests in the diagnosis of dementia. The the two common ones that we talked about, the mini mental status exam or mental, mini mental state exam, that's the classic one where there's 30 points possible and it's the famous one that's been with us probably for 50 years or so. And then a more recent one called the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and that is less language-based. It's um, you identify animals, you do dot to dots, and you do a clock drawing exercise. That's a more recent addition to the, but it, but it is a very significant and, and used commonly um, on our geropsych unit at, at Herrick and um, in Kaiser. The Number four, the seven stages of Alzheimer's disease and the characteristic behaviors. So remember the seven stages, stage one is no apparent symptoms. Stage two, forgetfulness. It's not usually noticed by other people. Stage three, other people are starting to notice. If you have a, the person still has a job, coworkers notice their, their performance is deteriorating. They can get lost driving. And then stage four, it gets to be more moderate cognitive decline. 
where they're forgetting major events in their, their history, starting to confabulate, um, and, and they're, they're trying to hide it from people in their life. And so they, they tend to not go to family gatherings. They're, they're depressed and they withdraw socially. Stage five, there's some moderate cognitive decline and their ability to maintain their ADLs diminish so that they start to stink and they get even more confused and and um, they didn't have knowledge about themselves. This is a patient that will be alert and oriented to self only sometimes, but they don't know what what year it is, what time it is, you know, or, or the event, you know, what, what's going on, why are they in the hospital. The sixth stage, the big thing is wondering becomes a problem. It's more the severe cognitive decline. Um, this is where they can get sundowning in the late afternoon, which is a form of delirium. Um, and and they usually, usually it's not safe to have them at home at this point. And then the seventh stage is severe cognitive decline, where they're usually just kind of sitting in a slumped um, posture with their eyes downcast and not really not really engaging much tend to um, the cause of death is usually choking to death on something or aspirating and getting pneumonia all right number five the ways to differentiate between dementia and, and depression which is a term we use as pseudo dementia which is actually depression in the elderly Pseudo means kind of like fake, like fake dementia. And so depression can look like dementia in the, in the elderly. And so um, the, the, the person that's actually a pseudo dementia, which is depression, they're more depressed in the morning time, more confused in the morning time. They, um, they're upset when they can't think of an answer where the person that truly has dementia they're not upset, they just confabulate or they say something that's completely wrong, and but, but they're not upset by it. And the person with um, that truly has dementia is confused late in the day. The person that actually has depression is more confused early in the day, like I said a second ago. <clears throat> so validity therapy techniques, um, we don't reality orientation, the neurocognitive disorders patient because they don't <clears throat> they can't process it and and um, some of the reality orientation like oh you're no your spouse is dead is very upsetting to them and so you want to um, respond to you know the, the feeling tone of what they're what they're saying you don't you don't re um, try to reorient them to reality like you would with a regular patient mm -hmm. Number seven, that's kind of a general one that's experienced, work with patients to identify behaviors, genetic factors, and environmental factors that create risk for delirium dementia. Then that's a kind of specific to um, experience. Number eight, how would you respond to a family member who asks if a patient will ever recognize him or her again? And the important thing here is just to remember that that's a very painful question to ask and you would want to respond with your using your therapeutic communication skills and um, something along the nature of it that it's very painful when your loved one doesn't recognize you anymore um, and the reality it, it depends on um, what kind of you know what kind of dementia they have is if, if it's alzheimer's they probably won't recognize you again if it's um something where it's not as predictable a course like um vascular dementia like i described with my mother um it kind of comes and goes but the the key to number eight is is that you would use therapeutic communication to first of all you know respond in an empathetic way that, that the person is going through some pain to ask that question Number nine, identify the different subtypes of subtypes of dementia. So, like we said, Alzheimer's is the most common form. It's about 50 to 60 percent of all dementia. Then we have the Lewy body variant, the one of the ones that is makes the person they're less confused, but they're more violent and and um, you know they have hallucinations and 
you know, they're, they're much more stressful to take care of. Then we have vascular dementia, usually caused by strokes or, you know, small strokes like TIAs or, or um, can also be somebody that just hasn't taken care of their diabetes or coronary artery disease, um, whatever that's that people do that are lifestyle factors that are hard on their blood vessels can cause this. HIV dementia and then dementia from substance abuse, most prominently um, Korsakoff syndrome, also known as Korsakoff psychosis from, from the thiamine deficiency that, that's caused by chronic alcohol use. Frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder, which is the another one that makes you violent, it used to be known as Pick's disease, and um, you know, like the Lewy body, they're a little less confused and hard hard to take care of because they're so violent. And we have dementia that's caused by the the neurodegenerative um, disorders like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis, and then we have the Normal pressure hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, which can be <clears throat> relieved by putting a shunt in the brain. A very common surgery done several times a day at um, most major hospitals. Then we have dementia caused by head trauma. And so um, that can be a person that's been in a car accident or done you know, something like a professional football player that has a lot of head trauma is just part of their day-to-day -day life. All right, and then with the caregiver, identify adaptive and maladaptive coping and develop a plan to assist the caregiver to manage the caregiving role. So parts of this would help the caregiver, <clears throat> educate the caregiver on what to expect, you know, what's normal, so that they understand that, you know, the person isn't acting out or misbehaving, that, that's just part of their, their illness. Um, help the caregiver find resources so they have some time away so that they're not um, overwhelmed. Something like the caregiver day treatment programs like, like Alzheimer's of the East Bay. Um, social day programs, which is similar to Alzheimer's of the East Bay. And trying to get families to, to share the burden if, if families are trying to take care of it or at least you know, hire somebody for a couple of the days during the week so that it's not all on the one person. All right, and then number 11, how do, how the medications basically work to slow the progression of Alzheimer's. So just in a nutshell, um, Aricept, Exelon, and Razadine, those three are, that's one category. Those three, they inhibit the enzyme that, um, that metabolizes acetylcholine between the, the nerve cells and that makes where more acetylcholine is is available to be docked on the nerve sites um, and so basically those three help increase acetylcholine and then mement mementidine um, namenda they raise glutamate by by blocking the overexcitation of the in NMDA receptor. <laughs> you don't need to know that. What, what, what you should know is um, Namenda helps increase glutamate. That's how it helps with the memory. Um, those other three, I, I think I do want you to know about the enzyme. It inhibits the enzyme that m helps metabolize these just because that's a simpler thing and, and more, more likely to show up on the NCLEX in your future. And so, um, in general, though, know that those first three increase acetylcholine, Namenda increases glutamate, and those are the two neurotransmitters that help with memory. All right, I hope this has been a pleasant experience for you, and um, that this recording turns out well.